Welcome to uh, Global Challenges 2014. I am um, highly appreciative of your great sense of style and wit and endeavour to learn by choosing this elective module. Um, before I begin, can I have a quick show of hands? Who, uh, who is a first year student? Anyone a first year? And second? And the third? Right, okay. Um, good, right. So, uh, whenever I give a lecture, uh, at the start of the lecture, I always give what I call as a T-shirt message. Um, the idea of a T-shirt message is whatever you're trying to say, you should be able to get that message down on the front of a T-shirt in not extremely small font. So it's got to be a general headline uh, message that you want somebody to take home with them after you've finished talking to them. And so today, all I'm going to be talking about really is what the Global Challenges module is, how is it taught and assessed. With regards to the assessment, there's going to be a specific... Uh, workshop next week, most probably next Friday, which I will uh, deal exclusively with the assessment. So today it's just an overview, okay, just a very uh, brief introduction to what the assessment methods are. Some of you have already looked at this website, uh, gc.sotton.act.uk. Um, I know some of you have looked at it because I look at the stats. So it's a, a website that's hosted by the university. I can't tell who has looked at it, it's not as if I'm checking up on you, but I can see the number of visitors and which pages are being viewed. If you haven't looked at this website, then I would recommend that you certainly do so before Friday, because this is the website that I will use to teach the course. I don't use Blackboard. Um, does anybody use Blackboard for some other modules? Does anybody like using Blackboard for the other modules? Okay, yes, no? <coughs> okay, I hate it. Um, I just don't like it at all. The reason I don't like it is because I find it difficult to use because I'm a bit of a Luddite when it comes to technology. Um, whereas this website, it's nice and easy for me to use and also I just think it looks nicer. So I'm going to use this. You don't need to log in. Um, anyone can look at this website. It's externally facing. It's on the public internet. Um, what I'll do is I'll send emails around when I post things up on there. But if for whatever reason you're not sure what you're meant to be doing and what's going on in the course, if you check this website, it will get you up to speed very quickly. So, certainly before Friday, I'd recommend you all have a look at the resources tab, which is over here, because um, this will give you your core material. We've only got one textbook, and that's uh, a book by Donella Meadows, edited by Diana Wright, because unfortunately it was published after uh, Donella's death. Thinking in Systems are Primer, okay? Um, thinking in Systems is very much what this module is about. Thinking in Systems doesn't mean thinking about maths. There's no maths in that book. Uh, there's no mathematical formalism. We might be talking about math mathematical ideas, but there isn't any maths, okay? So the maths phobic uh, of you need not be worried or concerned. So have a look at this uh, resources tab, and then you can see down the side there's these kind of side uh, menu items, side tabs, and that will give you a wealth of information about the subjects that we're going to cover. I keep putting more information in here, so do keep checking it. And also, if you've got recommendations for things you would like to see in there, then please do let me know. So what's the global challenges actually about? Well, you most probably heard of this thing called climate change. You know, we're increasing the amount of carbon dioxide, the amount of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere, and it's beginning to have an effect in ways which will be bad for us and for future generations. You might not have heard about the fact that we're currently in the middle of what some people argue to be one of the greatest mass extinctions uh, in the history of life on Earth. The current rate of extinction is hundreds, if not thousands of, no worries, thousands of times greater than the background extinction rate. And when we think about split, sorry, is that bothering anybody, the clangy, clangy business? If it is, you can pull the blind up a bit, yeah. <coughs> so when we think about species going extinct, we often think about enigmatic species like the dodo or threatened species like um, tigers or polar bears. Uh, but most species that have gone extinct, we didn't even know they were there because they happened as a result of habitat destruction. The greatest biodiversity hotspots in the Earth system are in the tropical rainforest, and we've chopped down half of them, and by current rates of deforestation, by the middle of this century, there's going to be less than 20% left. And once species have gone, once habitat's gone, it's pretty much gone for good. Also, we've been affecting the Earth's hydrological cycle. This is, or rather was, the Aral Sea, which in a matter of decades went from being the world's fourth largest freshwater lake to a series of much smaller impoverished lakes, largely because the rivers that were flowing into them were diverted for cash cropping. And overlying all these kind of issues, we've got this notion of not just international governance, but transnational governance, because increasingly the global challenges are affecting countries across their borders, and we don't have the political instruments, we don't have the legal instruments in order to be able to do something about it. Somehow we're meant to collectively self-organise and fix all these problems. 
So it's in that context I'm going to talk about this thing called the perfect storm. Um, the perfect storm in this kind of socio-ecological context was coined by um, the UK, or the previous UK Chief Scientific Officer, Sir, uh, Sir John Beddington. And he said by the middle of this century, or even before that, um, but around, let's say, 2015, we're going to be in a situation where we're going to have to produce 50% more food, generate 50% more power, and gain access to 50% more fresh water. Because there's going to be more people, there's going to be 8 or even 9 billion people alive. And if you want to lift all these people out of poverty, make sure they will have a decent life, Remember, there's at least a billion people that go hungry on this planet still. Then we're going to have to n move uh, a lot more materials around in the Earth system. We're going to have to make the Earth system work much harder for us, at the same time as reducing our impacts on all these kind of ecological systems. And that's not trivial. And I think it's fair to say that nobody's got any idea how we're going to do this. And so my particular take on this, uh, where I got involved in this subject, is that I see the global challenges, this perfect storm, as a challenge of systems. Because when you start trying to figure out how you're going to feed more people and generate more power and gain access to more water, at the same time of um, preserving biodiversity, making sure species don't go extinct, increasing the welfare of people, if you just focus on one aspect of the challenge, then very often you make the other ones much, much worse. You need to look at it quite holistically. And so this is what I do in my day job. If you want to know more about my research or other teaching, that's my website. And if you ever want to get in contact with me, then that's my email address. But I, um, I've got a lectureship in complex system simulation, and I boldly claim to model the Earth system in order to try to understand how it works and how humans interact with it. So it's typically multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary research and teaching that I'm interested in. One of the reasons I'm interested in that is a reaction to the classical uh, picture of the academy or science and research um, conducted uh, in this university and across the world, where these are your academic disciplines. So each one of these pillars might represent a particular program of study or a subject. It might be science, it might be physics, mathematics, philosophy, history, or even within a particular subject, let's say you're studying physics, these pillars might be you know, condensed matter physics, um, non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Whichever subject you go down into, you get finer and finer graduations, you get more and more specialism. And already, I would say that you are pretty specialised. You most probably specialise in terms of what you want to do at university. You were thinking about what you want to do at university when you were at school, think about the kind of GCSEs you wanted to do, think about the kind of A-levels you wanted to do. And by the time you've done three or even four years of undergraduate study, you're going to be very well knowledgeable, but within a potentially very narrow field of discipline. If you want to then go on and do a master's or a PhD, you'll be even more specialised. And what the global challenges tell us is that no one subject, no one discipline is going to be sufficient for addressing the challenges. These are fundamentally interdisciplinary uh, problems. So, one of the motivations of this course and the way that I structure the course is that we do lots of group work <coughs> and we do group, hopefully, in broad multidisciplinary groups because we need to do that if we're going to fix the challenges. But then also, more generally, being able to talk to people and understand what they're doing is very important. It's very important for your own education. It's going to be very important when you go on later in life when you leave university. So, for example, if I was to ask you what a philosopher looked like, you may have this image pop into your head. It's like an old guy with a big beard who talks in long, incomprehensible sentences. If I was to ask you what does a computer scientist look like, you might think somebody like this. <coughs> somebody who's got a kind of fetish for technology, maybe finds it hard to deal or interact with other human beings. And if I was to ask you what a biologist or even more generally a natural scientist looked like, you may think it'd be somebody like this. Um, unfortunately, it's another man, another beard, glasses, a white coat, and he's looking at something very intently because that's what you do with the sciences. <coughs> so hopefully, by the end of this module, we can have a better appreciation of what students who are studying something other than your particular program of study are doing and why they would want to do that and what contributions they have. Now, I do have a certain amount of sympathy for these three particular roles because in a way, I've sort of played them. Um, when I did my undergraduate degree, which was now a phenomenally long time ago, I studied philosophy. And then after that, I did a Master's of Science. And then I ended up doing a PhD in a Centre for Computational Neuroscience and Robotics. And then after that, I became a research scientist at a Biogeochemistry Institute. So I've kind of done lots of different things. I'm not particularly special or interesting, but I'm not very standard in terms of the route that people go through. They typically do the science, A-levels, they do a science, uh, undergraduate and then I go <coughs> on and do a, a science PhD or something. I've kind of bounced around some of the disciplines. 
And I do just so happen to think that that's going to be an important requirement or skill that we're going to need if we want to solve the global challenges. Okay. Um, so that's what the overall subject matter is. I want to spend a bit of time talking about how the module is actually going to get taught. So, the normal way in which you undertake uh, a module, or the way in the module is taught, is that there'll be a lecture like this. So you're all over there, and you're all looking at me, and I'm talking at you. And then you'll go away, and you'll think about all the clever and wise things that I've said, <coughs> and you'll internalise that, and you'll become much cleverer and wiser. Maybe even as clever and wise as I am, perhaps one day. Well, what we do in this class is called flip teaching. Anyone heard of flip teaching before? Re no one? Okay, right. So flip teaching is when we turn the classroom upside down a little bit. So rather than give a lecture and you will watch a lecture and then you go away and work at it on your own, what we do is we, you, we look at lectures individually. So this is a video of John Shepherd, who is a professor at the no National Oceanography Centre and he's giving a lecture on climate change, the physical science of climate change. So last year, John gave me a lecture and uh, like this. So he gave a lecture and you were all sitting there and you would have watched it and then you go away. What I've done this year is I've recorded the guest lectures and produced a series of videos and during the course I'll tell you when I would like you to watch that video, then you uh, watch it, you maybe watch it individually or in groups, you think about it, you talk to your friends about it and then when we come into the class we actually do this, the kind of the homework in class. And a lot of the homework is working in pairs and working in, working in groups. So, uh, these are the guest lectures that I've got for this semester, for this year. I've got them in terms of I've uh, filmed pretty much everybody. I haven't edited all the talks yet because it takes a phenomenally long time because I'm inept at editing. But I will uh, get them all done when we need them. And I'll talk a bit about the schedule later on. So... You watch the videos at home or whatever, and then you come into class and you discuss them in a happy, joyful manner. Because it's much fun, much more fun working with other people than scratching your head trying to figure out stuff on your own. And this also alludes to a certain element of peer learning. As well as me trying to teach you stuff and you trying to learn on your own, you're going to be working with other people, and that can be a very effective way of actually learning anything at all, called peer learning. The other thing I do is something called just-in-time teaching. Anyone heard of that? Right, it's got nothing to do with cheetahs <coughs> or, or predators or mammals whatsoever. Well, it's got something to do with a mammal and that it's motivated. Well, my motivation stems from this guy. Does anybody know who this is? A bit before your time. Okay, this is uh, Donald Rumsfeld, who was both the youngest and the oldest uh, Secretary of Defence in the United States administration. Fascinating, isn't it? In the 1970s, he was the uh, Department of Defence Secretary under the Ford administration, and then in the early 2000s, he was the uh, Secretary of Defense for George W. Bush. Very interesting character. But he's known for his strange um, speeches, his kind of uh, gnomic utterances, so much so that somebody actually made a book uh, and claimed it that they gathered his speeches and they argued that this man was actually an important existentialist poet. And I would recommend you actually seek out some of his work. It's deeply spiritual and uplifting and enlightening, but there's one uh, particular piece that I want to talk to you about, and it's this one here. <coughs> As we know, there are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. It's deep, isn't it? It's very pithy. So, with regards to uh, what this has got to do with flip teaching, is uh, I know there are things that you know, right? So I'll know that you're a University of Southampton student and I'll know that you'll have a general education and I'll know that you'll want to do this module so I can make certain assumptions. I'll also know things that I don't know. I won't know uh, all the particulars of your education. Um, if you are studying uh, biology, you might not have read any um, history of philosophy for a while, if ever. If you're a humanities student, you might have no idea what, let's say, thermodynamics is. But also important, there are unknown unknowns in which I think I'll be able to teach you certain things and I think you're going to react in a certain way, but I don't know until it actually happens. What this means is that some of the lectures or some of the material that I prepared will be blank right up to the time in which I'm going to deliver it. In fact, if you were in the classroom last year, you would have seen me typing away 
actually doing slides, preparing materials, sometimes in lectures, sometimes in workshops, as the actual workshop or seminar activity is happening. Because as I'm going around the room and I'm talking to people, I'm seeing how they're reacting or they're responding or the things that they're saying, I might want to change what we're going to do next. I don't want to waste anybody's time. If any, and also, if somebody's not understanding something or there seems to be a bit of miscommunication, then I want to take the opportunity to make sure that I can fix it. What this means is that if I say well, I'm going to give a lecture about something on a particular date, I'm not going to have the lecture slides available for download by that particular date. And I know for some people that's really important because you like to be able to go to the website, know what the subject's going to be, print off the lecture slides, and then when the lecture's happening, you can annotate them or scroll around or say this is the important bit or refer to previous bits in the lecture. It's not going to happen with regards to my particular lectures. Um, moreover, it's not going to happen because many of my lecture slides don't actually make any sense. Um, they'll just be a picture. Um, I'll talk around the picture. Um, I'll say why I've got this picture up here, or might not even do that. I'll just allude to why the picture is there. Uh, for whatever reason, my particular teaching style is I just don't like to have words or even bullet points on my slides. I much prefer to talk to people. Um, if you're worried about not being able to uh, understand the slides, if at some point you have not been able to um, come to a lecture, then I'm going to make every opportunity to record the lecture so I've got a mic on at the moment and I'm recording what I'm saying and I'm recording what's going on on the screen and I'm going to put that up online. So for whatever reason you can't make it to one of my lectures, then you can have the opportunity to actually um, replay it or actually listen and watch it for the first time. Um, and that will be on the YouTube channel. But once again, if you want to know anything that's going on in the course, look at the gcsotton.act.uk. And also goes for the guest lecture videos. If you miss a guest lecture video, if we do an activity on a guest lecture video um, and you miss it or you haven't watched it for some reason, then it's always going to be online. You're always going to be able to catch up. So what this means is that one does not simply print off James's slides because they won't make any sense. And whilst I'm talking about this, I may as well mention the fact that I tend to use memes a bit. I, it is a heroic um, effort on my part not to have entire lectures with nothing but meme slides but um, it's in good will that I use them. I think they can be an effective way of getting a point across, such as assessments. Assessments everywhere in this module. We don't have one assessment, we actually have four. So you might be saying, why do we have four assessments? I didn't know we had four assessments. I don't want to do this module anymore. Well, uh, the motivation is generally um, about feedback. This is a typical model uh, for how a module is assessed. So you start at some point, and at the end, at the end of the semester, you get hit with an assessment. And then you hopefully do, do well because you've been learning actually over the period of that and you get a good mark. If you don't, then, well, the assessment has a kind of a punitive failure. You get punished for not learning during the module. I prefer this kind of format in which you have assessments nearer the start and you actually learn something from that and then you can incorporate that into your second assessment and then the third assessment and the fourth assessment. So over the time scale of the module, the assessments are important vehicles for giving you feedback, for telling you how you're doing. They're also important vehicles for letting me know how you're doing because if, if for some reason you're struggling with the assessment, then that makes me think about whether or not we need to revisit anything or if I have to change anything in the future. So the thing about the assessments, the constant challenge is you always want them to start as soon as possible, but there also needs to be sufficient time for anyone to learn anything and to get settled in in order to be able to do any kind of assessment. So what that means is that I'm actually flexible on when you think we should have the assessments uh, submitted by. I, don't, um, I can control when we have the uh, assessment submitted. It's not like an exam which has to be um, scoped out months in advance. So when I talk about the schedule later, I want to talk to you or start a conversation about when you think we should have these assessments due. And then when we meet on Friday and the next week, we can continue that discussion. So what are the assessments? Well, uh, the four assessments are, uh, there's two individual reports and there's two group activities. And collectively, that means that half of the module, the total module mark, is assessed by individual activities and half of it is assessed by work that you do in a group. So, what's the first assessment? The first assessment is um, thinking in systems. So the Donella Meadows uh, course <coughs> uh, textbook is our course workbook. Um, there are a lot of copies in the library, um, so please do get one. And they're not on short loan. You can have them for an extended period of time. 
Um, and it's also possible to get a PDF version of the book. Um, but you need to come talk to me if you would like that option. Okay. So what is thinking in systems? Well, basically, uh, Meadows and her colleagues over a period of years devised a way of thinking about what seemed to be intractably complicated problems or complex systems in a way which teases out the important elements. And it really is just about identifying the bits and how the bits interact. And so the first assessment is going to be a relatively short report in which you'll be able to say, how can you look at a system? Um, what are the elements of a system? What's a stop? What's a source? What's a flow? Um, where are the leverage points? What are the intervention points? It's relatively high level. Um, and it's not a tremendous amount of work. But it's really important that we establish that because we're going to use that as the framework to then look at the rest of the actual global challenges. And the element or the assessment two will be, well, one way to look at it is you've got this perfect storm. You know, we need to produce more energy, more food, access to more water. Why is that not just a storm in a teacup, right? So why can we be blasé about it? Why can we... Why do we have to worry about this? And so what we're going to do, we're going to use uh, the things that we've learned about understanding systems, and we're going to apply the systems analysis or systems approach to this thing called the perfect storm. Certainly for the first assessment, for the first report, I would like you to use a particular, uh, a particular template that I will put on the website and that you will download. I can put it in a Word template, uh, DocX, um, even a latex if you want, if you want to talk to me about particular requirements that you have. And the motivation for having it in this particular format is that some people will be very happy about writing essays. Maybe if you're a third year student, humanities student, you've been doing it for the last three years, maybe even five or six if you did it at A level. Some people who come from a physical sciences background, it can be a very long time since I actually wrote an essay. And last year I found that people had really good ideas, they had very good input, but they were getting caught up, they were getting tripped up over the fact that you had to write an essay. And they were spending enormous amounts of time thinking about, you know, how do you do the introduction, what's the abstract. So I want to help you as much as possible. And so the, there will be various sections and I will give you um, a certain amount of guidance or be quite explicit about what I want you to tell me within the relevant sections. In a way, it's a kind of a lead in in how to write an essay. So then for the second assessment, we'll have a bit more of a flexible format where you can write a more uh, longer piece, perhaps, if you want, or a more critical piece. The third element, so this is the first component of your group work, is a poster, or perhaps more accurately, it would be an infographic. So an infographic is a way of representing some information. Um, and what I want you to do in groups is to take one or more of the global challenges and then effectively communicate it to a person in the general public. Effectively uh, communicate it in a context of the global challenges and the context of systems. Okay. So, um, to give you an example of how important the representation and the communication of information is, I wanted to give you, uh, I wanted to show you this uh, quick clip, which was made from the Gapminder application. Anyone heard of Hans Rosling, the joy stats? Okay. So uh, Gapminder is the application that he built, or at least it's been an important part of its development, and it allows you to visualize data, allows you to make statistics come to life. And all I want to show you here is that we've got time on this axis, so we start at the start of the 19th century all the way up to uh, the first decade uh, in the year 2000, and on this axis here we've got yearly CO2 emissions in tons, so it's one, two, three, four, billions of tons of carbon which are being emitted into the atmosphere from two countries. The first country is the United Kingdom, which is orange, and the second country is China, which is red. And so what Gapmine allows you to do is to produce kind of dynamic little videos of stats. And you can see that throughout the 19th century, the UK's emissions are slowly going up. Now, China doesn't actually get into the game until the start of the 20th century. For the first part of the 20th century, uh, there aren't really any... Ah, oh, it's raining. I didn't bring a coat. Bugger. But anyway, um, it um, doesn't really do anything until there. Here, this is the Great Leap Forward, the, the massive advance in the industrialised base. And then you'll see what happens to Chinese emissions. All right. They're taking off. This is actually um, uh, quite similar to an exponential uh, curve, an exponential increase in carbon dark side emissions. Okay, so when you show people this figure, they have a particular reaction. All, all manner of different reactions. Isn't it terrible? What can we do about it? 
well, hang on a minute, why are they increasing their emissions while, we're, um, while our emissions are remaining flat? You've got questions of fairness, uh, questions of international uh, cooperation, obligations, responsibilities. You're telling an important message with that particular video. But you can also tell a different kind of message with essentially the same data if you rescale it a little bit. So what these two figures are showing is the amount of warming, which is analogous or essentially equivalent to the amount of carbon dioxide that's been emitted uh, per country as uh, proportional to its overall surface area in this one. So the amount of warming uh, per unit area of land, or down on this one, oops, sorry, the amount of warming uh, per capita, per population, the amount of warming per billion. Now, what you'll see here is that some countries stick out. There are some red countries, and typically they're the European countries. Um, and you'll see the United Kingdom is doing um, disproportionately well in this metric because it's been emitting carbon dioxide for a very long time. It's the first country to industrialize. So even though current day emissions aren't very uh, great, it's had a very, very long tail in which when you add up all those emissions, and its surface area is very small. It's a relatively small country. Similarly, the United Kingdom is one of the reddest countries here again because uh, we've got all those emissions and we don't have a particularly large population. Whereas if you were to look at China, China is actually light green. It's uh, over here. And the reason is, is because its development has happened much later, but also there's over a billion people in China. So individually, um, somebody in the United Kingdom will uh, be making a much larger contribution to, let's say, global warming or climate change than an average individual in China. So the kind of data that you want to present, the story you want to tell, becomes very important. And it's an important skill, and it's a useful skill, and it's something that I want you to work on when you do uh, your assessment number three. Assessment number four is a group presentation. So you give a talk, which some of you will think is cool. Already, some of you will think that's possibly the worst thing you could ever imagine, because you don't like giving uh, talks, you don't like public speaking. What I've suggested that we do is that you don't give a PowerPoint presentation, is that you give something like a Prezi presentation. Anybody heard of Prezi? Okay. So Prezi is a way that you can uh, run a presentation and make it an awful lot more appealing and interesting than a bunch of static bullet points. It allows you to zoom around, allows you to put in uh, multimedia. Uh, this particular presentation is using some clever tricks and, and whistles and bells and things, um, but you can do an awful lot with it. And last year, the presentations that were produced by Prezi were really very, very good. So I want you to take uh, the subject matter of the poster and then I want you to give a talk, an engaging talk to a general audience about the global challenge, maybe the global challenges, and how you can understand them as a challenge of systems. The other good thing about Prezi is that it's well suited for um, working remotely. So you build your Prezi presentation online and you can have numbers of different people all collaborating and working on the same presentation. You don't have to be physically next to each other to do it. So they're the assessment and uh, this is the schedule in as garish a colour scheme as I could imagine and here we see when I think this is my opening gambit, this is my, my initial bid of when I think we should do the assessment. So report one here, report two here, the posters come uh, here and then the presentations come at the end of term. This yellow bar is Easter. So I just want to point out that uh, report one I've got scheduled for coming at the end of week five. So there's, like I said, there's the constant balance between I, I want you to be able to know what it is you need to be assessed but I want you to be able to incorporate what that is um, as soon as possible. So here we are today, welcome introduction, and then on Friday, I'm going to give a lecture, and then there's actually going to be a bit of a workshop activity afterwards, which will go into some depth about the global challenges and what they are. Monday, uh, I beg your pardon, Tuesday, is then we actually do this thing called a systems primer, where I give an introduction and overview of what systems thinking is, what systems dynamics is, and maybe even a more general introduction into what science or science modelling, um, what the scientific method might be. Um, and then on that Friday, we spend a bit of time uh, getting into groups, doing some group work, and learning some things which actually make group work more effective. Because it's no good to be sold, just get into a group and expect these wonderful things happening. You actually do need a bit of help with some of the facilitation. Um, then there's another lecture from me, and now these, these items here, these are, all these are all when you watch 
a guest lecture video, and then we do an activity in class about it. So we will work in pairs initially, and then we'll talk about the video and what you took from it, the good points, the bad points, the things you don't understand. Then we do some group work, then there'll be some kind of lecture material, and then we go back to doing pair work and group work. <coughs> so by all that time, hopefully, you'd have sufficient resources and understanding in order to be able to uh, put in the report one. Bearing in mind also that I've scheduled out this period here for a coursework lab where we can actually work on it in class. The challenge now is for me to turn around those reports in sufficiently quick time in order for you to incorporate what I've got to say about it in time for report two, which I suggested happens before Easter. Now we could, because I'm going to have all these submissions electronically, I don't want any paper, you just uh, you kind of uh, send it via, most probably you actually will submit it via Blackboard or something. There's no reason why you can't submit that over Easter. Uh, but I'm aware that some of you disappear over Easter and it might complicate matters. But we can talk about that. If you've got any strong opinions about it, then please do let me know. Over Easter itself, and actually over pretty much that entire period here, you're going to be working in groups, you're going to be building those infographic posters, and you're also going to be uh, producing your group presentations. So the idea is, pretty much as soon as you come back after Easter, uh, Easter there'll be another coursework lab, there'll be another lecture here, but then the last two weeks are what I, you know, um, boldly claim will be the Global Challenges Conference. Basically, it's a whole series of talks where there'll be a workshop program or a conference program, and in your groups you will present um, your uh, particular topics, um, there'll be a bit of convening, there'll be some questions and answers, but essentially we'll take up the entire teaching time in class for t giving your group presentations. This is Slack, so I'm not sure what we need to do there. Um, the challenge that you've got in giving your Global Challenges talk, especially th how many of you are studying geography? Any geographers? Geographers are always going away. They're going to warm, nice places when I want to give them assessments. So it might not be possible to get everybody within uh, those slots. We might have to use this one. We may have to move this around. I don't know, we, we're going to have to be flexible to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to do their presentations. And the other kind of dark red terracotta -y colour is this one here, where I'm currently scheduled not to be here. Um, and I'm not sure what I'm going to do about that yet, but I shall let you know next week. <coughs> right. So that's the schedule. It's online. Whenever I change it, I change it like every 30 minutes at the moment. Whenever I do change it, I'll update it on the website. So um, most probably by tomorrow morning, that won't be uh, relevant anymore. But if you go to the website, click on uh, lecture schedule, then you'll get the state of the art. And please do tell me, send me an email if you think that you're not going to be able to submit something because you're going to get hammered with other assessments then, or you don't think that's going to be enough time, or you prefer something to be moved around. I'm willing to hear what you think about it. So um, I'm going to do a bit of a wrap up, which are kind of a motivational group speech. We can do it. Um, the thing you need to bear in mind is that this module is non-standard. So uh, the content is non-standard. You don't really get modules like this, the kind of things that we're going to try and cover. The teaching is non-standard. Um, the emphasis on peer learning, on group work, is not very standard. But what that means is actually <coughs> it's a lot of hard work. Um, so if you're willing to put in the effort, um, and I am, then I think we can actually do it. I can't emphasise to you how important it is for you to actually show up. Because I put so much of the material online, um, I put the guest lecture videos, I put my lectures, I put the assessments, um, there's a ton of stuff in the resources section. This, the, you may be tempted to think that you could pretty much catch up um, independently by doing independent learning, pretty much like a, one of those MOOCs, those massive online open access course things. It's not going to go well, because you're going to do most of the the actual learning of this module in the class. It's working in pairs and working in groups. Where that's where it's going to happen. So if you don't engage fully with the program, then uh, it's not going to go well. But moreover, you're just not going to get a lot out of it. Um, the thing that always strikes me about this module is the, the bits that everybody really likes is the bits where they get to work with other people. Um, it sounds cheesy, but it is actually true that people like to work with other people, and they like to hang out, and they like to figure stuff out with them. The most miserable times I can remember as a student when I was on my own trying to understand something, either a textbook, and I felt overwhelmed and I couldn't do it. So if you show up and if you do put the effort in, there's a tremendous amount of support you're going to get, 
Um, I'll support you as much as I can, but you're also going to get an awful lot of support from everybody else because we're all in it together. Um, and to conclude, uh, I will actually explain this slide then. Um, so the point of this slide, and I give a lot of, I give a lot of um, public lectures, so you know, outreach and engagement activities, and I always tend to use this slide because it, it motivates a lot of what I do. So the issue about the global challenges, um, they're, they fundamentally stum stem from overconsumption or overexploitation of natural resources or sinks. And that happened um, before you were born, largely. It, it's continuing to happening, but the fact that we've undertaken so much deforestation, the fact there's so much carbon dioxide uh, in the Earth's atmosphere, you know, these problems were not caused by you. But unfortunately, these are the problems that you're going to have to live the rest of your life with. And if Beddington is right, if we really do have this perfect storm which is going to face this in a matter of decades, maybe even 20 years' time, it's you the ones who are going to have to figure it out. So I certainly believe, um, as someone who's interested in research and teaching, and more generally I make the case that the university has something of a moral obligation to try to let you know what these challenges are and to try and equip you with some of the skills that you're going to need in order to actually solve them. So it's, it's an intergenerational um, obligation, it's an intergenerational responsibility. Um, and that's why, after all, I decided that I wanted to uh, develop this module. Right, that's it in terms of the actual lecture content.